Right, hi everyone and thanks for watching and I am delighted to bring to you today a, a, a gonna, gonna be having a discussion here about home education um, and, and why this sits on on the channel for reshape is well all of the work that I do is concerned with helping people enjoy a richer human experience and of course all human experience begins with childhood experience whether it's individually or collectively and uh, and so it's a subject that's very dear to me. And I'm joined by my friend Yasmin Page. Um, we met through an, an alternative educational setting um, that both of our children were attending. And we now both home educate our children in, 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 in a form, uh, although we'll get to the different forms of home education. Um, and I really, I really value your input and, and your thoughts, Yasmin, because Yasmin's experience has been as uh, you know, she trained as a teacher in Sweden and has taught in both secondary and primary settings in Sweden and England, um, and also is the mother of of nearly three children and um, and home educating yourself. So, welcome and thank you for coming to talk to me about this. Thank you so much for having me here. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. So. Home education, the term, I think in the course of this past year with this with the lockdown circumstances and everything has been, mm -hmm. the term has been used probably more this year than than ever mm -hmm. cumulatively in history. I mean, everyone who's been administering the the you know, the national curriculum or the, the school education programme at home has been referring to it as home education, but it seems important to me um that that we that we unpick it a little bit and make some mm -hmm. distinctions. So I, agree, I wonder yeah. if you share your sort of insights or experience around the definitions. Yes, I think uh, we hear a lot about homeschooling at the moment, I think. And I think it's important to distinct, you know, to make a clear distinction between homeschooling and elective home education. Mm -hmm. Because um, homeschooling, the way most people have experienced during lockdown here in the UK and also in other countries, uh, it's actually following the national curriculum and also um, the school uh, with the teachers and everything and their daily routine, which has often involved uh, Zoom calls or other video calls, etc. And so that is quite different to uh, elective home education, uh, which is um, a choice between using any curriculum or no curriculum whatsoever. And uh, often when it goes to um, families who, who choose to not have a curriculum at all, it's um, a term called unschooling, which is also something I think more of us are hearing mm -hmm. at this time. So it can be anything from following a curriculum to, to following no curriculum whatsoever. So it's quite, yeah, quite different actually. So homeschooling is a really broad term, and I think most people prefer to use the term home education mm. because of that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the difference between offering school at home mm. and the many different forms of, of supporting the experience and development of children not being at school. Yes. And if it is defined in some way by, by not attending a, a school or a kind of a, a, a space that is... Um, you know where the intention is is sort of dedicated to learning. Yeah. What kind of benefits are we looking for when we when we opt out of that, as you see it? Mm. That's a really good question. I believe that um, this period um, during lockdown, when parents uh, had to uh, often juggle their own work and uh, supporting their children with their schoolwork. At the same time, it's been quite an eye opener to uh, too many parents, and what I hear and and um, see a lot um, during this year has been the the reactions to that really, that uh, parents have a greater insight now in a way into what their children are actually learning, apart apart from just the homework that was set previously. So now they're seeing uh, more of what they actually do during the day. Um, and have a greater insight. And I think that has been quite an eye-opener to a lot of um, parents, a lot of families. And for some, it's been a good experience, absolutely. 
but for some it's been really uh, difficult, challenging, and they have also felt that they don't really actually agree with with what the national curriculum and their school is offering their children. Mm. So I think it's been, um, yeah, very, I mean, everybody has had their unique experience of this time. And I believe that more and more families, parents are seeing the benefits of actually having their children at home um, and how they learn. And it's been, um, um, yeah, an eye opener, I think, for many parents. Whereas previously, it's been more, you know, learning it happens at school, mm. and it, they're uh, and the parents have been quite hands off when it comes to learning, uh, and in this way, they've been more engaged and also have had to experience the resistance from the child, perhaps, mm. like I don't want to do this, and how do you get a child to do what you want them to do or what is needed to do? Yeah, yeah. There's a couple of things that came up in in that 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 really sort of resonate with me. I guess the first is it, it feels funny or you know inaccurate at the least um, when we talk about learning, sort of differentiating between learning and other areas of life. Yes. Um, I know just in my personal experience that that I I have learned so 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 much more outside of educational settings mm. and and you know I I like to see learning as a mindset um, and I try to support that in my son's experience. I, I've always uh, felt friction with the idea that learning is something sort of narrowly defined that needs to take place in a certain environment mm. at certain times and 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 that's learning and and if it doesn't look like that it's not learning. And I suppose the other thing is which is hand in hand with that um, which you touched on is is just that sense of trying to get children to learn stuff that we want them to learn mm. because it, it seems to me or again in my experience of, of learning anything that when you feel inspired or however you want to define it whether it's a flow state or inspiration or or whatever I mean you're you know you're like a sponge you pick stuff up and it seems to me that children have a really direct access to that state. I mean, they, mm. they live in a flow state left to their own devices. Mm. And it, it feels to me like it's a sort of, mm, uh, a bit of a sort of a corruption of, of their natural ability and capacity and drive for learning for us to define it narrowly yes. and then coerce the children to learn particular things in particular ways exactly um, yeah it, it, it seems important that they that, that they don't learn that learning is hard and dry and mm. and narrow experience exactly like it was for so many of us mm. growing up uh, in school uh, not everybody's experience, but I think we've all experienced our dry moments in school. I think that's inevitable. Yeah. But I totally agree. And that's also why I chose to home educate my own children. Mm. Um, just exactly for the reasons you said, Joe. Yeah. Mm. I don't believe in um, the coerciveness within our edu current education system. Yeah. I question that yeah. and I be do believe that children learn naturally and they are at that state naturally mm. and what we can see unfortunately in, um, in a child's life at school is that that natural inquisitiveness and curiosity mm. that it actually um, it dies mm -hmm. with time often not always but often it does which is a, a really sad thing and what we're looking at today is, well, do we want children who are lifelong learners, who are always uh, interested in, um, in learning more about what um, engages them or, or what um, piques the, their curiosity, uh, rather than um, this set um, amount or, or um, this set um, curriculum that they need to yeah. to learn that 
we have to remember is arbitrary, really. Mm. Um, it's not something that um, we question often because we often think that the educational authorities, etc., they know and they have their reasons for, for, for what they present in the curriculum or what's asked of the children to learn. And really, there are so many uh, experts in their fields, like mathemat mathematicians, who said, who looked at the national curriculum and said, "This is this is this is insane. Why would a, a young child have to learn this at this stage? That's not age appropriate. That comes much later." You know? yeah, yeah. So, so it's about starting to question. You know, why do we have these subjects or this particular part um, of the subject in? in the, our curriculum at the moment yeah. and not see it as as um, something uh, almost uh, you know natural that we just assume ever, all children need to learn at a certain age and at the same time mm. so it's questioning that and looking at that free learning because mm. uh, that happened much later and actually um, so, uh, research shows that when a child learns something when the child is ready for it whether that's at the age of eight or 16, <clears throat> they actually um, pick it up and learn it really quickly like that. Mm. It doesn't become this struggle, which we, we often, you know, experience as teachers or parents. We have our children struggling with, you know, specific subjects or areas in a subject. And, and really, um, they're, they're often not just not ready for it. Mm and they need to do other things. They might be going through a really strong kinesthetic stage at this moment, and they need to explore that. And, mm. and we have a very narrow understanding of child, natural child development, I believe. Absolutely. Um, I completely agree. And, you know, there's a few things that I wanted to pick up in what you were saying, but, you know, with regard to the kinesthetic thing, the idea that we're, we're encouraging five-year-olds you know, mm. we, we, we want them to, to stay ahead. Yes. Just on that subject, interestingly, my experience is, you know, I was keen that, that my son really, I, I love books, and it, it, I was keen that he didn't have his relationship with literature um, kind of, uh, you know, um, sort of squashed by mm. having a bad experience of sitting there with a the book. So yes. when, when they were sort of trying to encourage or when people around us were sort of doing working on reading and, and stuff out in the early years when he was maybe five or six I was like it's okay it's it's fine he doesn't need to do it yet he'll do it when he's ready yeah and then when he was seven and eight and his you know his other friends who were at schools they were sort of you know reading and writing mm. and stuff and and my son still didn't have any interest in it yes I was started to question myself mm -hmm. and I felt I felt fearful I felt like you know have I let him down mm. um you know, have I contributed to a lack of confidence with the subjects as a re as a result of him not mm. um, not doing it? And it it you know, but with retrospect, I realised that was my own experience and my own fears and projections. And and of course, of course, he would learn to read and mm. write. And the interesting thing is now that he's ten, I I I have never asked him to pick up a book, but that's his go to thing that he does. He mm. just sits down with a book and reads and he can do it for hours on end. It's one of his favorite things to do. Um, and, and so, yeah, as you say, it take as a parent, it takes faith and in a, mm. to a certain extent, nerves of steel yes. and a willingness to look at your own fear. Absolutely. Um, but the children will will do come to it. It's just it's so yes. easy to question yourself when the context that you're in is is different to that. Absolutely, absolutely, and I would say that what you just exactly what you're saying, the example uh, of your son picking up the books, you know, without you having to prompt or ask him to do it, mm. that's the beauty, that's the most beautiful thing, mm. I believe, in just trusting your child and trusting their natural process, yeah. and 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 to see them unfold, you know, like it's a it's a beautiful thing to behold. It really, mm. really is, mm. and. We don't see that enough in the classroom, mm. classrooms out in the country or in, out in the world, I feel. No. Because we, we, we do feel the pressure for whatever reasons, we feel the pressure that uh, our children need to, um, to learn this skill before a certain time. Yeah. I think that's inevitable. Mm. 
And so really what it comes down to is if we let go of those expectations, we let go of that and leave that and instead <clears throat> move into trust and a completely different context where we see the child as the learner and not us as providing constantly. Mm. Um, yeah. In that sense, then we, we see magical things happen. And in some regards, it can do, it can do, I mean, one does need to tread carefully because, mm. you know, you gave the example, I mean, a couple of examples. One, one that you mentioned earlier was maths. Mm. And my son and I went to a, a lecture um, from, a, from a, a sort of a maths communicator. And he explained that in adults, when asked, I can't remember what the example was. It was, you know, it was a percentage. It was like, you, you know, you, you pay a, it was simple. You pay a, maybe, you know, there are 10 people on a carriage, 20% of the people leave. Yeah. Um, how many people? And, but they did it under MRI. I think it was right. MRI. And, and the area of the brain that lit up when faced with a maths problem uh, was the same area of the brain that lights up when when somebody perceives a sort of a primal threat. A snake is the example that the guy gave. Wow. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, the, it can't be just that there's an innate issue with numbers. It's, it, and I imagine that this is the kind of experience that people might pick up along the way when they are pushed. Yes. But the other thing that you mentioned that, that seems important to me is the kinesthetic thing. I mm. mean, you know, when, when if people, if children from the age of maybe three, four, five, I mean, again, there's no, there's no one size fits all. And I'm not criticizing anyone for any, any practice, you know, the well-intentioned practices, but, you know, expecting a three, four, five year old child to hold a pencil mm. when the bones in their hand haven't formed properly and they haven't got the fine motor movement mm. and they're being confined to a desk or a chair which one is a nightmare for your hips, your ankles, your back, mm. everything. I exactly. mean, the fact that children are required to sit in chairs as a physical therapist for yeah. me is 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 uh, a serious problem. Mm. But also the idea that, you know, as we talked about children developing in their own pace and their own way and the kinesthetic thing, the idea if the children are needing to move, it's because it's part of their neural development exactly. and, and they're not going to develop those fine motor skills to do the tasks that we want them to do That's if right. they're not allowed to, to be out and flowing and moving and, and expressing themselves through their, through their bodies and with their bodies. Exactly. That's exactly right. And uh, uh, I am with you 100% on that. Mm. And I think the lack of um, free movement, the lack of free play, unsupervised play even, and the lack of um, out time outdoors in nature. I mean, this topic is so complex and has so many um, nuances to it because it's not just about us pushing um, specific learning or specific, specific uh, curriculums or agendas on our children. It's also what are we depriving them mm. of? Uh, and exactly like you say, a, a five-year-old needs to climb trees mm. um, and move around freely outside, bring fresh air, in connection with nature, mm. all of those things that there's not much time in the day for that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. When you sit inside in a, in a classroom, yeah. down in a, on a desk, often, not always, there are, we have to remember there are classrooms out there um, where they are m moving around more, I can sit on the floor and there's more um, flexibility, I would say. So not everyone sits at the desk all the time. Nevertheless, more than a five-year-old should ever have to, mm. or six-year-old or seven-year-old. And um, everyone who knows uh, one or two things about movement or natural child development or, or uh, physiology knows that a child needs uh, that experience before uh, he or she is ready to sit down, like you say. Mm. Um, so, and, and, and when, that, when the child is ready, uh, that's different for each child. Mm. So. There is no one size fits all, I and mean, that's something we need to remind ourselves. Yeah. yeah. And for some children, sitting down to write isn't that interesting at the age of eight, but might take to it when they're ten or eleven. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, yeah. And it's about having that nerve and trusting. And I think why it's so hard for us to trust ourselves is because um, we were untrusted. We were, we were put through this education system where 
we failed or we got, didn't get good grades or you know something happened that was negative if we didn't follow, mm-hmm. if we didn't please. That's another really interesting subject. I mean, when you're when you're engaged in the process, what is it that what is it that the child is actually learning mm. in 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 the process of what it is that we're we're inviting them to? Mm. So if you have a system where they're required to to get through whatever hurdles like exams or something, mm. um, are we are we teaching them primarily? the information that we want them we want them to 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 absorb and retain information mm. like information is important to us and we want them to have the information so that they feel empowered mm. or are we teaching them to to look externally for uh, a sense of uh, acceptance mm. satisfaction pride um, are we inviting the children to look to us for approval mm. um, what is it that they're learning when they're engaged in these processes? I think to answer that question, we need to look at what is the purpose of the education system in the first place. Mm. And I don't think we can talk about that without um, looking at the political aspect of it and without having to go down uh, that hole too deeply. Uh, I would like to, uh, to point out that um, every country, every government has an agenda for their population. Uh, and we live in complex times, so, so you know, the powers that are aren't just our governments anymore. There are many other um, political powers out there that affect. But to boil, boil it down, <clears throat> the curriculum is not, is not random. The, the way um, schools have changed from um, actually um, being l- slightly more child, um, uh, how do you say, centred or so, to becoming more and more about tests, more and more about exams, uh, more and more about these things. And I know that a lot of people are reacting to this and wondering why is it going in, in that direction? Why, are, why isn't it improving? Because we have all the research, we have all the knowledge and understanding of how children learn and and that they learn at different paces, that they need more free play in nature and so on, and mm-hmm. art and many other subjects, but there's such a focus on academics, etc. Mm-hmm. And I have my personal uh, views and opinions and thoughts on why that is, uh, and I'm not saying that in any way they hold all the answers at all, um, but I believe that we all need to be questioning, questioning why is my child taught this and not that, for instance. Yeah, and it's not necessarily malevolence, is it? I mean, we are engaging with a system that was designed through industrialization mm. for industrialization, and also I, I remember in the um, in the education setting where we met, mm. um, the when you're managing, I mean, it was a very small setting. Yes. It was a small community that we're in, but I can imagine that when you're responsible for managing large numbers of children in one space, large numbers of schools in one area, large numbers of area in a country. I mean, you know, for things to be quantifiable is, Mm. I remember in the setting where we were, we, where we were met and Mm. where we were supporting the children together. Yes. um, There was discussion around the possibility of measurement first, but it's Mm. complicated, isn't it? I mean, first of all, you have to decide um, you know what what it is that that's important to measure. What are the markers of mm. of a thriving child? Mm. And then you have to work out how you're going to measure it. it how you're going to measure it without there being a sense of measuring it. Mm-hmm. And then there's the question of when you measure something, do you change it? Like mm. when you observe something, does it change? Um, and you know, mm. these people who are responsible for for policy decisions, they are accountable for the decisions that they make and I guess it's just a tough decision it's a tough uh, you know situation to be in where you have to be able to measure stuff Mm. and and that doesn't necessarily lead to the right outcomes for the children absolutely and I think it's important to remember that um, the education system is there in place 
to also to create um, uh, employees to create people who have jobs and so that's how our society is set up yeah. um, and to make that quantifiable like you say to measure and all of that um, is just a part of how how the system works at this time mm. and it it is no wonder that um, these measures are being used and also um, if you look at it practically from a teacher's perspective in the classroom, um, it is near impossible, near, I wouldn't say impossible, but very difficult to manage learning and behaviour without uh, such things as um, uh, reward and punishment, mm. in a way. Yeah. And there's a lot of pressure on teachers from higher above and, and a lot of pressure on heads. Um, and, and and they they uh, they don't have the choice always to just present the learning that they would like to. Uh, we have so many passionate teachers out there who love their subjects, but they are not always able to to um, convey that mm -hmm. in the way that they would like to because they are under a lot of pressure yeah. for this whole system to work in the in the way it needs to work, and where we can step in as individuals whether you're a parent or an educator is does it need to look like this mm. can it look different mm. can it be can we have a different experience or does it mean if i take my child out of this system does that mean that they will never have a job that they will never succeed that will that they will always be left behind um there are many worries and concerns if you want to step out or or take a moment to 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 observe um, what's what's happening really yeah which seems so pertinent at the moment because if if to me there's been one interpretation of of the situation between you know 2020 and 21 has been adaptation um, and you mentioned yes. earlier the idea that that if we're priming children to go into employment that mm -hmm. that may well not be uh, the future mm -hmm. I mean I know that there's a generation of young adults out there at the moment yes. who have, I can't remember what they're referred to as, there's a name for it, but people who basically have, you know, drift from short-term contract to short-term contract, mm. doing whatever somebody will pay them for. Yes. Um, yeah, it's, it's adaptation seems to be. But you mentioned, um, I, I felt there was a, a nice segue from, from what you were just talking about into what it is that home education looks like for you. In, in your in your children in your family if you've yes. started you so you've built your own way of doing things and I'd love to, to hear about what it's like what it looks like we're actually quite new to home education which is uh, interesting because it doesn't feel like it somehow but but we are um, although our children who are nearly nine and and six um, they have never been to uh, a mainstream school so we are always um, had uh, either alternative education and, or at least uh, with or at least also a day um, during the week at home as well so we've sort of um, always been outside of, of mainstream education and what we've really um, started with almost straight away was more of an unschooling approach uh, I believe which is, uh, I think that's probably a, a podcast in, in itself because it's very rich and very complex and everybody have their own views on what that is, mm. etc. But mainly, um, I would say that it's about um, letting uh, the, the child lead its own learning and that we as parents are more the facilitator rather than a teacher or setting the agenda or what needs to be learned. We can always encourage or, or um, without coerce, <clears throat> we can always um, present something that, uh, that we like doing, that we love doing, and that can be a way of you know, introducing the child to something new. Um, and there's, there's a, some responsibility in that, I believe, which is um, having the, the right resources available, etc. So... Um, of course, there are things required from the parent, um, but 
what we what we haven't done is uh, followed a curric- like a set curriculum because there are many interesting ones out there like also nature curriculums that people follow and mm-hmm. um, which might involve some numbers and literacy and those sort of things um, but we but we have chosen not to have a curriculum at all also because for for me uh, I really value learning more about my children at the moment so it's like this last year of lockdown I mostly taken a bit of a step back to observe them and see what they naturally gravitate towards and what they're interested in and then we can um, maybe have do some fun experiments together but it's not about having fun fun and ex- explore um, lots of things all the time it's also giving your children time to to be free to have that freedom where they don't need to constantly learn 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 and it's all about my own process my own um, conditioning I feel so when I'm worried oh what, what have we done today you know learning wise and mm-hmm. it's like the children have learned loads you know we yeah. we read together and they did some art we've been out in the forest we've done lots of things but it's my conditioned mind which is saying oh, we haven't done enough academics or you know we haven't yeah. always been a few days now we haven't done this so it's all my stuff mm-hmm. really and that's what I believe is the main thing if you want to home educate your child in a free learning way uh, or unschooling way then it's all about looking at yourself yeah. and that's not always that easy it's a process yeah. looking at your own shadows looking mm-hmm. at your own conditioning and stuff that you were programmed with through throughout your education mm-hmm. and to see that actually learning is really about something quite different and like you mentioned before our children are, are natural at it they, they know exactly and we know it when we're interested we dwell into it and and we ask questions and and we feel you know quite passionate about something and it's it flows it's mm-hmm. easy um, and then you know we ask we can ask ourselves why are we pushing all these things that our children are not really interested in at that point Mm. And if it's like more of a smorgasbord of, you know, experiences and learning, then they'll pick and choose what they are uh, passionate about with time mm. or interested in with time. I, I like that what you're talking about as an adult sort of unscrambling your our conditioning and, and, and beliefs and, and attitudes and, mm. and everything like that. And in, in that regard, I... I think sort of the you know the saying is true that our children are our greatest teachers yes. not just because they give us the opportunity to reflect back um our own attitudes and and, and values and and conditionings but also i don't know again with regard to the conditioning we have been raised in a in a in a sort of a um a reductive uh kind of um a society that 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 looks to quantify and that is is more cerebral necessary mm. possibly rather than either sort of heart or or flow felt yes. or you know compassion um and yeah when you were talking earlier about about the 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 whether the children had learnt stuff in the course of a day you know as well as that it that sort of idea that they that they're just they're constantly learning, um, yes. even if they don't appear to be. But I, I feel interested in the idea that um, that things that take place aren't necessarily linear, and and sometimes you know the state of idleness or boredom is sometimes what needs to take place before a massive breakthrough or discovery or jump or piece of inspiration or something. Absolutely. And uh, and sometimes just helping a child go through that experience um you know without judgment mm. and without trying to find escapism which again mm. is a learning opportunity in itself absolutely like if you're having difficulty we don't need to escape from it let's go through it That's right. um, and then coming out the other side of that of that mm. painful experience of boredom or or idleness with some incredible you know so yeah that sense that the experience or learning or wh- however you want to say it uh isn't linear like exactly. it, it, it will be in ebbs and flows just like everything absolutely and I often feel that um, 
the national curriculum or um, yeah, mainstream education in general doesn't take that into account. Mm. There's so much that needs to be squeezed in at every stage that there's simply no time for reflection or idleness, like you say, yeah. or boredom, which is such an important part of of life, really. And I think many artists can vouch for that. That's when the greatest ideas and mm. expressions happen. Mm. Is actually when when you're left to to with with nothing to do and you you're scrambling for something, and then it's a little bit of a soul searching moment. I think it's like, what am I drawn to? Yeah. And I don't. And children don't have to ask themselves that. They just gravitate normally. Um, and if if a child has been in the system for a long time, there might be some de-schooling needed, mm. and, which is a, a new word, I think, for many people, de-schooling. Uh, what is that? Um, but that's, I, I believe, a part um, partly needed for the parents and partly needed for the child as well. If, um, if we've been in the system for a long time and we have been... Um, sort of looking for external vali validation a lot from teachers and mm -hmm. parents. And, and the thing is that with children, they're not stupid. They pick up on this most subtle, you know, subtle things that when, 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 when teachers um, are happy because they've done something well, you know, they, they don't even need um, rewards or punishment for, to, to, to sense what, what we approve of. And that's really, um, that can be very, very subtle. And I think that can damage a lot. And I, th I don't think we need to be too hard on ourselves because I think we all do it. I mean, absolutely, I believe, to some extent. Um, but it's more about being careful and really sort of um, look, um, look at your own reactions and why am I approving of this? Why am I disapproving of this, etc. So mm -hmm. it's a lot about... Um, yeah, looking at your yourself and your own conditioning, mm. which is about, and that's a lifelong process. That's not going to happen overnight, which means we shouldn't be too hard on ourselves if we're not the perfect home educating parent or perfect educator. You know, that's that's a process that just um, um, will take time, but you need to let it happen, I believe. Yeah. Um, yeah. And perhaps let go of some of the things that you you thought uh, about learning and about your subject, perhaps if you're a subject subject teacher, or mm. yeah, so on. Yeah, I think mm. interesting. So, as as I mentioned in the introduction, you trained as a secondary school teacher, and you've taught in both secondary and primary settings That's um, right. in Sweden and England. Mm. What what was your journey like into education, and then kind of back out or away from or evolving from what you had learned when you were trained as an educator because this is exactly the conditioning that you're talking about mm. the d the d schooling yes distinct from the unschooling yes but you as a trained teacher must have gone through a, a fairly significant d schooling process what's yes. it been like going into education and then unscrambling and yes unscrambling is a good word actually i like that yeah. uh it's an interesting process because I've I've been um, during my own uh, schooling uh, during um, childhood and as a young adult uh, studying at university etc. I have <clears throat> I have been both the 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 child who who questions or the young person who questions the system and 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 the mainstream uh, curriculum at the same time as I um, also been one of those children who really looked for validation and 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 did really well in school for for a period of time so I've seen both and I think I went into teaching because I wanted to change things I want to matter I want I wanted to make a difference in even if it's just one child's or one young person's life I wanted to do that and I think most um, teachers uh, they they go into teaching feeling similar or similarly, yeah. um, and I th so I really I think my de-schooling or um, process or 
my um, process, educational process started uh, really early on. And um, I was lucky enough to study uh, subjects like history um, where we did, you know, question um, issues like colonialism and, and so on. So it's always, the questioning mind has always been there, mm. <clears throat> which I'm grateful for. And I think it's been impossible for me to be in a setting and just uh, immerse myself in it without questioning. So having worked as a learning support um, teacher for a while, for instance, here in the UK, I saw and heard so many things from children that broke my heart. You know. um, there were lots of lovely things happening too, of course, but it was it was really hard to understand what the system actually uh, does to our children, even before they've left their education. Mm -hmm. um, so many are disheartened and feeling uh, put down and not valuable um, to anyone because in, in this instance, because they were in a learning support um, setting. Mm -hmm. And so seeing what mainstream a mainstream um, education can do to children mm. has really ma 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 really made me question. And the next big leap, I would say, was uh, in, in my own sort of personal process was having my own children mm. and really just observing them and seeing how they learn. And formal education or mainstream education made even less sense to me. Mm. And we started talking about home education really early on and looking at alternative education. And I just felt that the more I learned about it, the more I read about it, the more I studied, the more I did my own sort of soul searching and shadow work and, and things about my own um, conditioning, I just realized that there is no turning back. There really isn't. And so we, we also found the, the educational setting where we met, which uh, felt so much more in, in alignment with how I saw learning and life because I really don't think we can separate the two things. Mm. For me, it became yeah. impossible to separate how I see life, how I see our society, our culture, and then at the same time be able to uh, separate so much that I can send my children to school, which is obviously uh, a part of it. Mm. It became impossible. So that's probably, to make a long story short, mm. I think the process I've, I've gone through interesting yeah because it's not just about um finding some sort of uh you know configuration um for experience for your children that's supportive to their development but it's also modeling isn't it yes um and i suppose it you know it, it's it can be inconvenient but what we are modeling to our children in in our professions and and uh, behaviors and priorities is is also a, a very profound part of their learning absolutely so yeah it's, it, it makes perfect sense that that what you were doing professionally had to come into harmony with what your priorities for the children were mm. yeah. that's how i felt i still feel and it's absolutely an ongoing process mm. i'm sure you can relate to that as well um yeah. as a home educating parent that you learn something every day if not every moment when you are with your children also when you're not with your children and you have time to perhaps reflect more um mm. it's it's yeah it's an invaluable process for me as a person uh where i felt that i've been given this opportunity where i can uh really um grow myself mm. and yes try as best as i can to model um some things to my children at the same time and realizing at the same time that the greatest teachers, the biggest teachers that I have in my life um, are them. Mm. Yeah. And so often I feel I wish uh, more children um, uh, could experience at least partly, you know, uh, that, that same thing and Yes, it's um, an invitation to really yeah, look at many things, I believe. Yeah. Mm. Much is said about the education 
system in in Scandinavia and you know particularly with regard to it being relatively progressive and with regard to it having later start times so you mm. know starting at the age of six or or so and and, and secondary yep. school starting at 13 mm-hmm. um what's what's it like i mean as somebody with experience of both educational systems what's kind of the inside scoop of of how uh, you know the Scandinavian or the Swedish mm. um, system is, you know, compared to the British system. That's a really good question, uh, and I haven't been in the Swedish education system for a long time um, because I've been here in the UK for the past eleven years. Mm. So I have friends who are teachers who could tell tell you more about the current situation, but I I do get a sense from uh, friends and also following uh, news and social media, etc. and talking to parents in Sweden, that it sort of follows the same pattern as here in the UK, that it's not becoming more child-led, but more, but rather less so. Mm. And so that's why I see the political climate overall in, the, in our world, um, mm. you know, correlates to uh, to how uh, education is uh, progressing mm. or not progressing, depending on how you see it, yeah. in Sweden. Yeah. But overall, I would say that it, uh, it surprised me coming to the UK how authoritarian uh, the system here is in comparison to Sweden. Uh, it's more relaxed overall. Um, there are no uniforms. You call your teachers by their first name and, mm-hmm. and so on. So it's, it's like the atmosphere is more relaxed to begin with. And I felt it quite, yeah, authoritarian and strict and controlling uh, coming to the UK. But I also realised that the education system in the UK looks so different. Perhaps not in mainstream, but because there's private education, alternative education, and the choice to home uh, educate here. So it feels like talking about education in this country is actually slightly uh, more difficult because it can look so different. One child's experience is completely different to an, to another child's. In Sweden, it's more uh, the same or similar. Saying that, I think socioeconomic um, uh, status and uh, geographical um, areas make a, a big difference. Mm. But there are no f- uh, or hardly any fee-paying schools, for instance, yeah. in Sweden. Um, also, home education isn't... Um, uh, allowed or well, it's not legal. I was going to ask that. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's one thing that um, that is uh, quite shocking to many. I, I believe here in the UK, where we have more freedom of mm. choice, which is a positive thing, I think, uh, for sure. But I also understand uh, coming from a Swedish system. I understand um, the state or the society uh, wanting to ensure that every child gets their education and that's where it comes from and I can really really understand that mm. viewpoint um, and I think that for 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 somebody growing up in Sweden it's actually quite a challenge to in a way to think beyond that um, for me before I I came to the UK and started exploring okay so where what are the alternatives and what what are we can we do before that, I had this idea that homeschooling people or home educated people were sort of religious fanatics in America who, who, who didn't want, who wanted to isolate their children from the world and from, from everyone else, and, and wanted to yeah. sort of mold their child into uh, whoever they thought they uh, they should be, mm. which is pretty much the opposite of, of, what anybody who home educates that I know, um, yeah. is doing, so. And I guess this is where the regulations come in, isn't it? Because there are people who 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 would do that, or or maybe who just don't attend yes. the school due to neglect, unfortunately. That's right. Yeah. So in England, we're we're fortunate that you can deregister from school and do your homeschooling, and and you may get a local authority reaching out and saying, "What are you doing?" And mm. you just tell them what you're doing. Um, That's right. It helps to have a little bit of evidence. So, with my son's learning, or you know. With my son's kind of, you know, the way that we've structured his 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 sort of weekly experience, 
like he writes a, a little journal at the end of each day that he sort of does something and you know if anyone asks then then we'll show them that but mm. but yeah it's it, it surprising that in Sweden you don't have the choice of doing that mm. um, with regard to the to the you know to the subject of of uh, you know checking on 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 what sort of progress people are making or, or what kind of what kind of progress people mm. can look to make um, in in home education or with this start of learning it, it I imagine for people listening who aren't familiar with it it may seem what we're talking about may seem a little nebulous um, and it seems to me that that might require a bit of a shift of, of perception mm. and one of the things that I find worrying about what I've heard through this uh, through this um, you know, I, I don't like the word, but through the lockdown, through sort of 2021, yes. um, is from from parents and from government has been the issue of the possibility of children falling behind or mm. needing to catch up. Um, and the idea that, you know, if they, if they don't go to school or if they don't have these online sessions administered, um, then that it's going to be of sort of long-term detriment that they're going to miss out on some piece of information that they're not going to pick up on otherwise and maybe key to their uh, future success, mm. um, which I, I suspect does need some untangling. Um, but I'd love to hear your your perspectives or ideas around, um, you know, first of all, around this idea of when people who are used to being in mainstream education come out of it, mm this sense that they have of of sort of panic or desperation or fear or of, you know, the falling behind mm. thing. So first of all, perspective on that. And second of all, I guess a perspective on on the subject of benchmarking. Mm. If somebody is still of that mindset, mm. what that looks like for, for a home educator. Mm. Those are really good questions. And I think um, it's different for every for everyone. Um, but I believe that the concept of falling behind is something we really need to look at mm. as a as a society. Uh, collectively, we need to look at that. I believe because um, touching a little bit on uh, on on what we spoke about previously about um, a curriculum actually being fairly arbitrary and that many experts, if you will, uh, within their um, subjects uh, openly disagree or question uh, why those specific um, parts of their subject is, you know, introduced at that age and so on, that that is arbitrary. Mm -hmm. So I think if we can openly talk about the curriculum being something that isn't set in stone, it's not like a natural... um, how do you say divine, you know, divine or natural um, part of life that every child should learn. It is something that we value in this culture. Or when I say we, I would say mostly the people in power value at this time. Mm. So for me, it helps a lot knowing that, well, a lot of it is, is it really required? Or I'm not saying it isn't, but I'm questioning whether it's required or not. Mm. So I think when the first step is really Uh, asking yourself those questions does my child need to learn this um, right now or if he or she is interested can uh, he or she learn it later on Um, and somehow taking the drama away from from it I believe is a good way of doing it like looking at it not so as seriously but because we've been conditioned to to believe authority and the system is always right and that's, in a way, that's the, the outcome that is um, uh, wanted in many ways in this system, I believe. Um, so, of course, we, we've led to believe that. And so why would we question that for our own children, in a way? Mm. Because we grew up in it. Um, what's the issue? Um, but instead looking at it as in... Uh, political way ideological that it's not random um, experts might not agree mm. um, and just yeah maybe take the seriousness away from it 
and just really look at um, what does my child need at this point in life. I think as a culture we're so future oriented, so focused on um, uh, on what they need in the future. And I also believe, unfortunately, it's very fear based. There's mm-hmm. a lot of fear among parents to make the right, um, you know, or to, to rather to make the wrong decision. Mm. Instead of really just looking at their child and, and seeing what, what does he or she need at this point? Because what we all we have is a present moment, really. Mm. And to enjoy that together with our children more, mm. rather than worry so much about the future. Mm. Because usually um, the future will sort itself out, you know. It's not something we can control as much as we believe anyway. Mm. We'd like to. That we like to believe, and on the contrary, I believe that we can often um, create more damage by putting all this pressure and putting all this information overload on our children. Mm. And so they associate, like you say, often academic subjects like maths with something so traumatizing mm. that they perceive it as a threat. Yeah, which is actually it's incredibly sad because maths can be this beautiful beautiful um, thing that explains so much about our universe and our lives yeah and instead it's become uh, something that's traumatized half a generation yeah, yeah. at least in the past I, I would include myself in in them mm. so we know how detrimental that pushing of an agenda is on to a child and so I think taking a step back really and, mm. and looking at what does my child need if it's is he or she thriving in this setting? Mm. Well, then that's great. That's then there are no issues. But if your child isn't, what is required in me to make a different decision? Mm. And I can only say, um, although I never deregistered, uh, as we've never been into um, uh, a, a mainstream education setting, I would imagine in whatever way you opt out, that there, that it does require some strength, uh, it does require some um, conviction, and um, I believe that once you make that decision, you grow a lot from it, mm-hmm. and you learn a lot from it, and it's a beautiful process, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, and realizing that the world hasn't come to an end just because your child is in a, in a mainstream school, and actually, uh, learning and living beautifully. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and I guess with regard to that that anxiety about about sort of benchmarking or progress mm. or, or falling behind. Yes. I guess if it is a completely different sort of paradigm, if mm. if what we're looking to do is to nurture self knowledge or to support self knowledge, which mm. is is one of the most important things to me, in in not being, uh, not being in a, in a very prescriptive. Uh, coercive system Mm. Um, so self-knowledge you know self-efficacy so being able to do things for yourself Uh, grow growth mindset Mm. so so knowing that you can continue to learn and adapt and as we talked about adapt like an ability to adapt a willingness to adapt um, which you know is perhaps linked to the other things but with that it's unfathomable that at some stage in the future a child or a young adult will somehow not be able to learn what they need to learn to accomplish any particular task that they wish. It seems mm-hmm. to me that for, for a child to contain those types of qualities yes. will surely enable them to, to adapt and progress in whatever direction they, they wish in the future. But it's a very, very different um, thing to, to what we're used to, which is um, trying to encourage children to, to, to absorb and retain information. Yes. And I completely agree, and I, I'm a firm believer, and also, uh, hearing stories from uh, now grown up children who've been home educated or unschooled, how they, through self knowledge, actually, which is, uh, I'm glad you brought that uh, word up because, self knowledge is, um, I think, key, really, mm-hmm. um, and that's how I feel, that I am, <laughs> and as an adult now feeling that I'm this lifelong learner mm-hmm. and I get excited about things, but it's been a de-schooling process for me to be able to feel like that. And mm-hmm. I believe that many, so back to 
uh, young people who are home educated or unschooled or without a specific curriculum, mm -hmm. that they today, they, because they know themselves so well, they know what they're passionate about, they don't have the same issue of, you know, finishing school, not knowing who they are, uh, not knowing what they're interested and passionate about because they spend so much time focusing on what other people want from mm. them. And also a reticence around the idea of learning, you know, mm. for learning to be something that doesn't feel nice. Exactly. Yeah. And perhaps going more for external approval and rewards um, rather than actually looking at what do I want with my life, mm. with my one, my one precious life. Yeah, yeah. Because that's what we should all ask ourselves, no matter if we're four or 84, you know, yeah. it's that's somehow what I believe it's all about. It's about we're here uh, for a reason. Uh, we're here with a purpose, with a calling. And if we are allowed to follow that joy, basically that joy, that inner compass, mm -hmm. rather than what uh, jobs are out there in the market, mm -hmm. um, then I think we can actually have a, a quite different world. And maybe that's a really bold statement, yeah. but I do believe that if we start looking at life and, mm. and uh, society differently, that we can actually create something new, create something different. And that's what we need. If we look around in the world today, yeah. I don't think we need more agendas or more curriculums or, or more prescribed learning. I think what we need is... Or more reductive thought. Well, yeah. exactly, yeah. exactly. I, I believe that we need uh, more... Um, unique individuals who, who who know themselves and who know what they're passionate about and those young people who are now telling their stories they're saying I'm a really happy person because I'm following my joy I'm following um, I, I've been allowed to follow my own passion yeah rather than uh, what's expected of me from somebody else mm. so I think the the, the danger of um, our current system, education system, is that we create uh, people who might be quite skilled in something, but they, but are they happy? You know, mm -hmm. Is there happiness? Are they, is that what they're following, yeah. or are they just thinking this is a safe, um, a safe job to get an income? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so uh, listening to you talk, and there's like three different strands there that <laughs> I would like to take, um, but aware that I literally have two minutes before I'm about to start with a client. So oh my goodness. <laughs> one, uh, <laughs> one final question yes. um, for parents who and I and I know many and I've worked with many children who who have a horrific time at school. I've worked with children whose parents question themselves daily mm -hmm. and, and feel trapped, don't know what to do, mm. um, you know, whether it's because uh, you know, academically, it's not a good fit in mainstream, whether it's socially, whether mm. it's kind of environmentally or sensorially. Um, there are all sorts of reasons why it, and ways in which it doesn't work for many children. And I know that there are lots of parents out there who feel trapped and who feel like, you know, there isn't any other choice. Mm. Um, and homeschooling, in terms of what we've been talking about, uh, is could feel like a real big jump. Mm. Um, what would you say to parents who sense that it's not working in mainstream for their children? Mm. What would you say to to a parent who's first of all? I would yeah. say, I would like to say you know all my you know empathy and compassion and you know I think there is um, there's a really strong sense from so many people I know who want school to be something which it simply isn't, unfortunately. And I, I have so much compassion for that. We all want that little school, you know, for our children to be uh, a warm and, and creative environment for our children. And so often what we're offered as parents are not matched uh, by the schools, unfortunately. And so what I would say, I suppose, is, you know, Take a moment and and really look at um, your choices or your options, your job options, because of, so often if there is a will, there is a way. Mm. And it sometimes it requires that we make changes in our lives. Mm. 
Mm. Maybe we can't work full time, but we can work part time or we can be set, become self-employed. And perhaps we can start following our joy a little bit more as parents. Yeah. And like you mentioned before, to model, to model that yeah. to our children uh, as well. So often I believe that opting out is actually more about opting into something different. And um, I think sometimes we have to make choices that we might not be quite completely ready for and do it anyway. Yes. And also see life as it's not final, you know. You can always uh, reapply to a school again if it's not working out for you as a family. So I feel less, you know, seriousness about it and and bringing more joy in life and, and follow that joy um, mm. is probably what I want to say. But compassion and empathy, it's not easy. It's not an easy decision. But, you know, there's so much beauty and so much learning to be held uh, on the other side, mm. basically. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I would say. Yeah. Thank you, Yasmin. Thank you one, so much. One other thing that just seems really important to say, just yeah. I was going to say it in response to what you were saying but then I got worried about the time (laughs) but just in my experience as well I didn't think it would be possible you know the learning community that that we were members of um sort of came to an end and and it was that that sort of uh you know led me to to just doing the homeschooling Mm. that we're doing at the moment and I wouldn't go back like it you know I don't regret it it's all worked out so taking the jump but also one thing that we haven't mentioned through the entire thing is just community. Yes. And the sense I know, and again, I'm going over a bit, but the sense I know that um, people feel that homeschooling children might miss out on something, but there's community to be found, isn't there? And it's there nourishing is. for the parents and the children. Exactly. I think we have a beautiful uh, home educating uh, uh, community where we are mm. and our children are not being deprived socially, I would say. I, th- I think they have a rich social life and good uh, close friends that they do t- uh, things together with. Also in uh, educational settings, uh, as well as, um, you know, free, in the, on their free time. Mm. So I think there's so much community to be found around. And we are, as a family at the moment, looking at uh, uh, becoming a part of some sort of um, educational, free learning, unschooling type of setting somewhere in the world. Um, mm. And because I really value community, I think that's what what, what uh, uh, we need for our future, mm. whether it's in a city or rurally, I think that's really um, important um, part of our, well, go, going to be a really important part of our lives in the future. So. That's what we're looking for. But it can be found anywhere. You don't have to relocate, I don't think. I think there are home educating families everywhere. Yeah. Who you can connect with and and learn together with. Yeah. And having <laughs> conversations like this with. Yeah. So yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much, Yasmin. Thank you. It's been a really it's a real great pleasure to talk to you and connect with you as always and, and hopefully of interest to some of the people who may have been listening or may choose to listen. My pleasure entirely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yasmin.